Hello, in this video, we're gonna be talking about some equations that would be helpful to memorize as you get ready for the IB physics exams. Uh, your data booklet, of course, has so many great, helpful, beautiful equations. It is your best friend. It will get you through the fun times of the exams, but even your data booklet doesn't have everything. So here's a few, um, really the big ones, the, the stuff that's not in your data booklet that I think you should memorize. So here we go. All right, in the area of mechanics, there's a few. Uh, of course, hopefully this these first two, um, you don't have to do any work to commit to memory because they should be deep uh, within your physics heart and soul. And of course, the first thing you think of when you think of work is delta E. It's the transfer of energy. It's how much energy gets added, lost, taken away by friction, whatever. And similarly, power is the rate of the transfer of energy, delta E over delta T. Probably best to think of delta E over delta T as all one big thing. Um, calculus fans, that's really a little DE over a little DT. It's a derivative. It's a rate of change, uh, how quickly energy is transferred. Um, yeah, but those should be the first places you go to, especially if you see power. Don't go to that power equals FV nonsense in your data booklet unless it really, really applies. This is the first thing you should be thinking when you think about work, when you think about power. Those are the definition equations. They're not in the data booklet because you better know them. Uh, another one you should definitely know, but is this guy, if you need to find the weight of an object, AKA the force due to gravity acting on an object, you just simply take its mass and multiply it by little g. Need, none of these things do we ever call just gravity. Little g isn't gravity. It's gravitational field strength uh, or acceleration due to gravity. If you prefer, same thing. Re remember, uh, think about this, Newton per kilogram, same as a meter per second squared. It's about 10. Use the 9.81 on the paper two. Use 10 on the paper one. All right, but multiply m by g. Don't forget it's a vector. And if you need to find an average, uh, do a total over total. So average velocity is total displacement over total time. Average speed is total distance over total time. That's the only time you can be thinking like meters over seconds is when you're dealing with averages. Anything else, you need instantaneous. You need your SUVAT equations or tangent lines on a graph or something like that. Okay, there is one big one one of the biggest like omissions from the data booklet, I think there's not even a data booklet section for topic 4.5, which is standing waves. They don't even give you any equations for standing waves. They expect you to derive them. So I'm going to show you a quick, quick recap of the way we derive these. Um, you, it's good to be able to do this, but you can also just memorize the result. So the math works out the same. If you have a string fixed at both ends or a pipe that's open at both ends, they both look like this. They're like kind of inverse of each other. So a string fixed at both ends. Here's a string of length L. It's like attached to like, a, you know, a wall over here, a wall over here. This is your guitar with like the, the um, you know, the nut and the, the bridge or whatever. Um, you know, uh, so you're vibrating a string. It's got a length L. The first harmonic, remember, is the simplest shape you can fit. So like the string has two nodes with an anti-node in between which makes this half of a wavelength. Picture that the length of the string in the first harmonic is half a wavelength. The pipe is similar, um, except you have antinodes at the open ends of a pipe. That's just your boundary condition, memorize them. And so you'll have a node in between two antinodes. Either way though, you still get half a wavelength here, same as you get half a wavelength here. So you could set this up by saying the length of my string slash pipe is half of a wavelength at the fundamental. Um, so we're going to use the wave equation, wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. In the data booklet, they use C for generic wave speed, which is kind of whack. Uh, C is usually speed of light, but you can use C if you like, but you might see V sometimes. So like get used to thinking of wave speed as V as well. So wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Well, if my wavelength is 2L, I multiply by frequency, solve for F, you get your fundamental frequency. There it is. Remember what that means, that's a frequency of the first harmonic. So if you can sketch the first harmonic, you can find this, just use the good old wave equation and you know, compare your length of the thing to the wavelength of the first harmonic's wave. All right, it looks like that. And if you have a pipe that's closed at one end, you get your uh, you know, um, empty bottle or whatever and blow across the top of it, make a nice sound. That's uh, basically a pipe closed at one end. And so you have like a node and an anti-node. This is actually a quarter of a wavelength. Right? So that's a quarter of a wavelength. They like to ask the questions about like why organ pipes are closed at one end. It's because you get lower notes with uh, less material. Um, okay, but there you go. So the length of the pipe is a quarter of a wavelength, meaning the wave speed would be the wavelength is 4L. Multiply that by frequency. 
and then my fundamental frequency would be this. So you get a lower frequency for the same length um, if it's closed at one end. All right, anyway, those are the two equations for fundamental frequencies. You want to memorize them or be able to get to those very quickly with those steps. And remember also the kind of defining equ equation that when they say, what's the frequency of the 19th harmonic? Well, you just find the fundamental frequency and multiply by 19. That's the definition of the harmonic number. Uh, remember, you can sketch this out and convince yourself that this is true, but like a pipe closed at one end won't have even numbered harmonics. You like can't fit a, a wave that's got double the frequency given the boundary conditions you got going on here. All right, but you know, the nth harmonic is n times the fundamental frequency. That's how we define what the harmonic means. Okay, there's your standing waves. It's a big topic, so being able to do that and do that math is helpful because you get no math help in the data booklet on standing waves beyond the wave equation. Okay, there's a couple electric field strength things you can do. Um, so lug is a good reference. The way they do this is interesting. The data booklet is very inconsistent in some ways. Here's one in topic 6.2, Newton's law of gravitation. They give you a beautiful combination here. Uh, the lug, the gravitational force is constant G times big M times little m over R squared. My definition of gravitational field strength is force per unit mass on a small test mass, blah, blah, blah. So what we do, they show us, hey, look, you can combine those. You can take lug and stick it in here for F. And if I do G times big M times little m over R squared, all of that divided by little m, well, little m divides out and I get this, the gravitational field strength, like near a mass big M, that's the field created by the mass big M, a distance R away. So nice, what a nice combo. They don't give you the corresponding same thing you can do with Coulomb's law. So let's do it. We can do the same thing and derive that equation. You will want to be able to do this. So since electric field strength is force per unit charge, acting on a small test charge at a point in an E-field, yada, 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 um, I could take my equation for Coulomb's law and divide out one of the Qs. I'm going to flip my notation here just because I find this a little more helpful. Again, the IB inconsistent in how they kind of do these, uh, which is weird. But, you know, it's K times like the f a force between two charges. You multiply the magnitudes of the two charges pushing or pulling on each other, divide by the distance between them squared. Well, let's call big Q the Q making the field and little Q the Q in the field just for the sake of argument here because then we can cancel out our Qs. Either way, you divide a Q. One of the Qs goes away and you get this. K times big Q over little r squared. That's the electric field due to a nearby point charge. So if you're distance away from a charge and you will find how strong its field is, you do this. This is how you do all those fun problems where it's like there's two nearby charges um, and you're a distance of r away from one and a distance of two r away from the other one, but that one's got a charge of triple the first one. You do all the fun ratio stuff. You gotta be able to make this equation to do that stuff. Okay, so make sure you can do this. It's just F over Q, plug in Coulomb's law for F, and you get right here the field due to a nearby point charge. What other fun thing you can do is find the field between, electric field between two parallel plates. And this is not really in your data booklet. There's like a delta V over delta R version in topic 10. Um, that's basically this, but it's helpful to just think of it this way. You can also find the electric field between two charged plates, take the potential difference between the plates, the voltage across them, in other words, divide by the distance between the plates, and you'll find the strength of the uniform magnet, or sorry, electric field inside of the plates. Remember, that's what you get in uniform electric field. Make sure you can sketch the field in between the two plates and picture why it's uniform, but that's how big it is. Also, last fun thing you can think about here, this must mean a Newton per Coulomb is equal to a volt per meter. Make sure you're okay that that's a thing and that you can convert between those fairly easily. And all these equations give you magnitude only. You need to assign direction. The rule is this, the electric field lines point to show us which way a positive charge, whoops, would get pushed if I put it at that point in the field. It's all very hypothetical because the field just describes what happens to the space around it. This picture here, just look at the plus and the lines going out, does not show any pushing at all. Nothing is pushing, it's just one charge floating in space by itself. There is no pushing represented here. What it shows is if I put a positive charge right here, it get pushed up and to the left. Now the same deal, if I came over here with a positive charge, if I put a positive charge right here, I get pulled to the left, attracted to the minus. So that's the direction of the field, but um, these equations give you the magnitude. Okay, enough of that, let's talk about circular motion. Here's a good one um, that comes up, which you can like do some data booklet manipulation and get here, but good to just remember this is a thing. 
This is a really easy one, uh, but think about the uniform circular motion. You're going at constant speed. If you need to figure out how fast, well, every period, you go one circumference. So take your total distance divided by total time for your average speed. There's a good time to use average speed. 2 pi r is the total distance you travel every capital T seconds, because that's the period. And the period, by definition, is how long it takes for you to go in a circle. Yeah. So do that to find speed in circular motion if you need to. Remember, you can do it. It's easy. What's not so easy is the energy of a satellite. So HL students, uh, remember this whole fun graph and how to do this. You get one of these. You get the equation in topic 10 for potential energy, which is this guy. But you don't get the other fun equations. So um, good to memorize the shape of this graph and the whole crazy like everything approaches zero, but some of it's increasing and some of it's decreasing because fractions and negative signs are so fun. Um, you can derive this one pretty easy, kinetic energy, because you just do one good old one half mv squared. This is one half mv squared in disguise. The thing is v is orbital speed, because if it's a satellite in circular orbit, then v is the square root of g times big M over r, says the data booklet. Plug that in, you'll get this. Right? So be able to do this with one half mv squared in the orbital speed equation. And then if you need the total energy, if you need a math expression for total energy, well, we'll just add potential to kinetic. And now one's a positive fraction, one's a negative fraction, one's got over 2r, one's got over r. Find a common denominator, have some fun, you'll get this. And that's your equation for total energy. Make sure you can do those. Energy of a satellite, they love it. They're very non-intuitive. It's the weird stuff where like a satellite uh, experiences some friction and you're like, oh, so it slows down? No, it speeds up. It gets closer to the earth and it speeds up. Go figure. This math tells you why. All right, so make sure you can do those equations. All right, last couple things uh, to memorize. Nuclear and quantum. Topic 12 has some good stuff that you can memorize. Mainly, definitely the biggest one. Uh, again, for HL students, make sure you can find half-life. Um, that's the equation. Kind of memorize it. Half-life is natural log of 2 divided by decay constant. You can do this by plugging into our radioactive decay equation. It's the time when the number of remaining nuclei equals half of the number you started with. So you plug this into the NO times E to the minus lambda T equation. The T you solve for is the time it takes for this to happen. So you can derive this by doing it. You got to like do some fun natural logging uh, to both sides and like natural logging of one half and uh, all that fun stuff. But um, that's how you derive it. So if you get stuck, you can derive it. Good. This is a good one to memorize though because it's a decent amount of math to go from here to here. And if you can save yourself some time, just memorize this. You will probably use it. Um, remember, as long as these units match, it's fine. You might get like half-life in hours, and so if your decay constant is in per hours, you're good. Years and minus and years to the minus one, just make sure they match. Uh, that's really all. One other thing in the data booklet, it's kind of in the data booklet, but not really. You can deduce it from the data booklet, but good to just point it out and think about it. Um, activity is the K constant times N, all right? The activity, uh, if we're doing it in like our kind of base units, Becquerel, remember that's a per second. It's a, you know, decays per second. So if I do it this way, then the decay constant's got to also be in per seconds because N is a unitless counting number, the number of parent nuclei remaining. This kind of shows us, remember, activity is proportional to the number of nuclei. It's that idea that the only way to make something less radioactive is to wait until there's less of it, because the only thing that'll affect radioactivity is how many radioactive nuclei you have. Um, so, you know, here's the data booklet. And again, it's, it, you can kind of see, hopefully, from these two equations that that's a thing, but uh, it's not exactly spelled out. So there it is spelled out. And last, not a nuclear thing, but a quantum thing from topic 12. This is a big one, de Broglie wavelength. If you ever need to find the wavelength of a matter wave, use this equation, h over p, that's not in the data book. You have to memorize this. And this one, there's not even like a sneaky way to really get there. Um, so p is momentum, h is Planck's constant, divide them up, you get the wavelength of like a matter wave. Electrons can diffract and do all kind of crazy wave stuff. This is the wavelength of them, depending on like their momentum. Um, and just here's one other. This isn't really something you even necessarily need to memorize unless you find it helpful and don't like math very much. But if you want a shorthand way to do like, okay, four half lights go by, how much is left? Or really just dividing by two, four times, right? You just cut in half every half life. This is helpful if you have like a problem where it says 15 half lives go by. Um, you know, you can divide by two 15 times, but think about what that is. That's the same as dividing by two to the 15th. Yeah. You can just say like two to the number of half-lives, do one over that. That'll tell you your percentage remaining. 
this is nice. This is kind of sneaky. It does actually do um, even handle a lot of the exponential decay stuff, so you can do non-integer number of half-lives with this pretty well. But um, this is kind of a sloppy cheating way <laughs> to do half-life stuff. So if it's helpful, um, that's a something you can you can use as a crutch. All right, and that's it. Memorize those, all right? Uh, like I said, there's there's uh, a lot of good stuff in the data booklet. That's the things that I can think of that you would want to memorize beyond it. So um, commit those to memory and you will have everything you need math and equation wise to uh, succeed on the IB exams. So good luck.